everybody and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast. We're thrilled to be back for another year. My name is Amelia. I'll be one of your co-hosts for the podcast today. And as always, I am joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Tim Silverwood. Hey, Tim, how are you feeling being back for a brand new year of podcasting? Oh, it feels so good. Um, And what a way to start off the series uh, lots of great conversations coming up. You know, we're a busy organisation, lots going on, but gee, it feels nice to set aside some time for these rich conversations to then beam into your ear canals and eyeballs all across planet Ocean. Absolutely. And we have a great episode today. I'm so excited. We've actually split this one into two parts. And uh, so you're listening to part one currently. Uh, but today we have Martin Kerring. Head of Economist Impact's World Ocean Initiative. And I would just say that Martin's just really a cool dude, right? If we had a best dressed award on this podcast, he'd definitely win it. Uh, He was rocking his UN SDG lapel pin uh, for this episode, which is super appropriate because this conversation with Martin came about from an amazing feature on Economist Impact called the Ocean and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I'm going to link this in the show notes. I really encourage the audience to go check it out. Incredible interactive animated feature. You know, Tim, the Slack channel, the team Slack was blowing up with excitement when we saw this feature. It's something we really you know, believe in at OIO. Might be the first time we've heard anyone else kind of talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those that are not up to speed, you know, the UN SDGs are this incredible framework to achieve a huge amount of progress on key issues by 2030. They were unanimously adopted back in 2015. And we've always known that the ocean and the work that we're doing to drive ocean health innovation and investment is so critical as part of this framework of the UN SDGs. So when we saw the Economist Impacts feature, which is a beautiful interactive feature that gives you a little bit of insight into how each goal relates to the ocean and the ocean relates to each goal, we were just like, someone's done it for us. And so when we reached out to the crew at Economist Impact, um, they said, you know, happy for you guys to talk about it. In fact, how about you have a chat with Martin? And here we are now with a wonderful podcast episode with him talking about each of these SDGs and the linkages. It's really crazy to see how the the ocean flows through each of these sustainable development goals. And, you know, Martin touches on something which uh, I'm sure hopefully will shock a lot of people, you know, I hope it shocks them, which is that SDG 14, Life Below Water, that is the kind of ocean SDG, is the most underfunded SDG, yet it's one of the biggest opportunities to address all 17 SDGs you know, and it touched on something I think we're passionate about, which is that the ocean is an opportunity and a solution to the problems that we face and, you know, not just a victim. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I guess for us, quite often you really just badge as being related to SDG 14, life below water, which we know is the most underperforming, underfunded, like we are not progressing anywhere near as fast towards that goal as we need to. But for me, what I found fascinating was just that all these other 16 SDGs had such clear linkages to the ocean. So that's why, again, like, I mean, these episodes are going to be very, very interesting for you to find out about those. But we're also going to make sure we publish a bunch of stuff on our social channels to really spread this awareness, to make people realise that if we want to see progress across the board, we have to be spending more money, more effort and more attention to the ocean because, as you said, Amelia, it's a source of so much opportunity whilst also being a victim of human behaviour. Exactly. And, you know, I think as we go through these, and and Tim, you just mentioned we've got um, a a great, you know, social media campaign, is Martin goes through every one of the SDGs in this chat, which is so good, you know, really telling people, explaining how the ocean ties in. But, you know, what I noticed was there's such synergy here because at OIO, we found that a lot of the startups, the thing that they have really in common is that there's many benefits to their solution, right? So might focus on 
you know, tackling one problem uh, and they focus on doing that really well. But what inevitably happens is that they impact more than just the ocean, right? And so many of the startups that have been through our programs who have been on Pitch Fest all kind of address multiple SDGs. You know, this is a, a framework really that startups are using to measure their impact. But do you agree with that, Tim? You know, and that's something I've noticed. Yeah, and that's why, you know, we're seeing so much interest from startups who want to participate in the accelerator program or emerging oceanpreneurs in the ideation program and even our pitch fest candidates they're coming to us because they know that they're an impact startup but maybe they don't know the full breadth or the best way to measure and to articulate their impact and then you look at the other side of the coin where there is a huge growing demand for investment into impact ventures these two need to meet in the middle startups need to figure out what it is that their impact how it is spread and how they can accurately measure and report it and that is going to be an absolute treasure trove of opportunity for the other side of the coin, which is the dollars that are desperately seeking a home in the impact investment space. So again, I think this is just a real moment in time with this piece of work done by Economist Impact, which is why, again, we got so excited about it because it is right in our wheelhouse and hence why we're talking about it today. Too right, Tim. You couldn't have said it any better than that. It sums up what Martin says in this episode and what we're all about, which is that the ocean runs through everything. Enjoy part one of this incredible episode with Martin Kerring. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, guys. I'm absolutely thrilled to have on the Ocean Impact podcast today, Martin Kerring, who is the head of Economist Impact World Ocean Initiative. And we are going to have a fascinating discussion about the World Ocean Initiative, but specifically an excellent piece of work that the guys created here around the ocean and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. A lot of people might not quite understand how the ocean interacts and relates to the 17 SDGs. We're going to find out all about it today. How are you, Martin? I'm very good. Thanks a lot, Tim. I've just come back from Lisbon where we had our World Ocean Summit, so I'm still kind of buzzing from all the excitement and energy at the summit. Yeah, here we are. We're in mid-March 2023, and it has been a huge few weeks for the ocean. Obviously, you mentioned there the summit, world leaders coming together, and we are looking at a bright future indeed. Well overdue, we dare say. Martin, I'd love it if, if you could tell us initially um, about the Economist Impacts World Ocean Initiative and your role there. Oh, definitely. It's great to speak with you. And so I, I lead the Economist Impacts World Ocean Initiative, as you said, which is really um, part of the Economist Group, which also produces the Economist newspaper. And we're really focusing on supporting the development of a sustainable ocean economy. And that's really focusing on this kind of addressing the greatest challenges that face our sea. So we have um, climate change, of course, biodiversity loss and pollution. And of course, year round, um, but also at our flagship event that, that I just mentioned, you know, the World Ocean Summit, which we held in Lisbon this year in person for the first time since 2019. But we have been continuing the conversation online. Of course, we had our World Ocean Summit online. We have our um, Inside Our series and we had our World Ocean uh, Summit Asia Pacific in Singapore last year. And of course, also our World Ocean Tech and Innovation Summit, um, which will really focus on bringing the kind of innovative startups together with the financiers. So all this still took place, but we're really excited to be back in person in Lisbon um, over, the, over the past couple of weeks. So we, um, we're really about inspiring bold thinking, but also enabling these really important partnerships. And I know you are also very much focused on that as well at the Ocean Impact Organization, you know, building partnerships, helping organizations to really explore those effective ways and effective actions to help create a healthy blue plan. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, why The Economist is so passionate and focused on oceans. And, and maybe also as part of that, you can tell us a little bit about how you came to, to lead that particular part of the organization. Yeah, Tim, so really the ocean has been a core part of our, our work and sustainability. And really in 2012 already we started uh, with the World Ocean Summit. We saw early on that the ocean um, isn't just, you know, this kind of source of risk, you know, where you look at, um, you know, the, the storm surges, the tsunamis, the sea level rise, the collapse of fisheries, all in the plastics, all of those kind of negative stories. But, you know, at, at, the, at the Economist Group, we early on, 
uh, you know, discover and, and, and focus on the fact that the ocean economy is a huge opportunity and such an underappreciated uh, opportunity as well in terms of the um, the natural capital in the ocean, which is, uh, you know, estimated to be over 24 trillion US dollars. Uh, but there's also all of the, you know, the, the goods and services, you know, global trade, uh, you know, 90% of global trade depends on, on, on the ocean um, and all these other opportunities that are often not talked about. And often they are nature based. Um, you know, we know that the ocean absorbs uh, about, you know, 30% of global CO2. Uh, there are huge uh, emission reduction potential from coastal and marine ecosystems such as, you know, seaweed, uh, seagrass, uh, mangroves um, and coral reefs, of course. Um, th so there's so much opportunity as well from the ocean in terms of its um, climate change mitigation potential, but also in terms of its adaptation potential, in terms of helping to weather some of those risks that, that I mentioned. And of course, the economic opportunity that comes from uh, sustainable aquaculture, for example, helping to you know feed the world, which is increasingly important given that our land-based systems are overstretched, but also wild fisheries are overfished. And then there's also the opportunity uh, that we see when it comes to decarbonization of shipping. You know, shipping accounts for three percent of uh, global e emissions, and there's a huge opportunity there with alternative fuels and technological solutions. So you know, there is a huge economic opportunity in, in terms of employment opportunities. Uh, in addition um, to the opportunity to, to tackle climate change by really harnessing the ocean's capabilities. So what's it like? Take us to your recent World Ocean Summit, everyone gathering together, and it came at a very, very unique time where there was huge progress made towards the High Seas Treaty. Give us mm. a little bit of a sense around the, the feeling at these events and what I suppose is happening here in 2023 with bold action to actually protect uh -huh. and enhance that opportunity for a sustainable ocean economy. Yeah, so it's really exciting to, to be, be back and really meet a lot of um, people that are enthusiastic, excited about the ocean opportunities. Um, and we really uh, focused on, you know, a couple of things that have in the past not you know, got the attention that it should be really, for example, blue finance. There's a huge opportunity there, you know, with impact funds, you know, we had Ocean 14 Capital there, uh, but also in terms of, you know, the, um, you know, UN, UNFI and others, you know, really getting involved and in kind of helping with the technical capabilities um, to, to help, um, you know, startups and so on to kind of work in, in countries and make sure that there's, uh, uh, you know, there's ocean innovation happening. And that, that finance opportunity, has really has really been neglected in the past and there's also the you know blue carbon credits for example that are emerging as a huge opportunity of course there has been this backlash i mean and even we talked about this during during our summits you know there's been a backlash against uh carbon credits in general but we see the blue carbon credits you know the likes of you know mangrove forests um seagrass meadows seaweed that's a huge opportunity because these are tend to be high quality uh, projects and they also tend to have all these co-benefits in terms of biodiversity restoration and also um, cleaning up the ocean around them like if you look at seagrass meadows they are really good at at, um, at absorbing these uh, these polluting nutrients so all of these kind of things we talked about the opportunity to deal with the three interconnected planetary crises climate change biodiversity loss and pollution and the ocean really isn't just kind of a, a place where we see these three crises come together, but it's actually a huge uh, opportunity to harness the ocean to deal with these three crises to really help address these, but also the SDGs. And you mentioned the work that we've done on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. The ocean really has this opportunity to address all 17 SDGs, not just SDG 14, which is, by the way, you know, the one on life below water is the most underfunded SDG. But in fact, if you look at the ocean, as an opportunity, uh, there's this huge uh, capacity to address all of the 17 SDGs. So you've worked in, in other areas and had experience around food and health and climate. This, this emerging opportunity that people are seeing around the ocean, does it follow any similar traits to other, I don't know, like, could we call them movements where people have gathered around, seen an opportunity and there has been that flurry of capital to try and make the most of the opportunity? Is there anything similar to experiences that you've had in the past or is this quite a new frontier with the capital you know, seemingly streaming into the ocean space? 
Yeah, I mean, in a way, it it is because uh, you know if you look at most of the challenges that we are facing, like for example, uh, you know we have population growth at the same time we have uh, climate change, which really puts a lot of strain on our food systems. And in the past, they, you know, there have there has been a lot of focus on finding solutions on land. Um, and if you look at other problems as well, um, you know mentioned you know the the fact that you know that we we have these carbon credits and we have this um you know this focus on uh, you know uh, taking carbon from the atmosphere there have, there have been so there has been so much focus on land based solutions and only recently the ocean has been seen as the you know the next frontier of really helping to tackle all these crises and uh, now that we're seeing that opportunity the money is is flowing in uh, like as we said you know there is this opportunity to actually harness sustainable aquaculture you know if we if we only look at how much food could come from the ocean i mean there was a study by the high level panel for the sustainable ocean economy that that showed that two thirds of all the human need you know human needs for protein could come from the ocean by 2050 and that's that's just massive, um, and particularly around aquaculture, there's been this uh, neglect. Uh, but now we are seeing that now that we that, that we, we we see the benefits for human health, but we also see the benefits in terms of economic potential. Um, that that's why this this next frontier is happening, and and with carbon credits. It is really happening because uh, in the past we haven't really seen those things. Like similar to the plastic pollution crisis, only you know recently when there was this you know focus you know the blue planet and when we have actually v- you know, visibly uh, seen this problem you know with, with plastic pollution, then suddenly people have realized that something needs to be done about it. Similarly, with the opportunity around seagrass, seagrass is, it isn't really visible. I mean, it's it's underwater. It isn't really. Uh, it isn't really seen by people as much as it should be. It's only 0.2% of the seafloor, but 10% of the ocean's capacity to store carbon. And and there have been studies recently released that show that 2.3 trillion US dollars, that's the worth of uh, just the carbon sequestration capacity of seagrass. And it's hidden. And in a way, people have neglected it. Um, and it, it's it's been in decline. And now we see the benefit of restoring these ecosystems. So that's why I think for many, many of these uh, problems that we are seeing, the ocean is the next frontier because we are seeing the benefits of investing in these solutions. Yeah, really captivating just to think on that subject of seagrass. I mean, it has been Mm -hmm. out of sight and out of mind, but as we become more capable when it comes to monitoring and gathering data on, I suppose, the capacity of these ecosystems to, in this case, hold carbon, but also what has actually gone into creating the degradation in the first place and all the things that need to change to enable it to actually flourish again, you can really start to see how one small seemingly myopic issue can actually relate to so much more. And if there's a financial Mm. opportunity around it, then you can really start to see a huge amount of change. Yeah, that's right, exactly. There's this uh, acceleration now in... Uh, in these investment and and in a way we see uh, you know we see the economic potential emerge and that's why the money is there now it's just about you know creating the investable projects um, that that is one of the biggest problems that we've seen so when we went uh, to Halifax to have our World Ocean Tech and Innovation Summit uh, we 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 found that you know there there isn't a lack of of money and often the the issue that you hear with with um, you know climate projects or uh, in general with with any kind of innovative uh, projects you you know there's often a lack of of money like the startup capital I mean helping to kind of make these projects a reality but that's not really the case I mean the money is there I mean only the only one example the Asia Development Bank which uh, you know, has has done a lot in that space recently. Their, uh, you know, their program on the ocean economy is is worth five billion US dollars, and it is not uh, the lack of money. It is the lack of bankable projects, and that means, you know, really identifying what means bankable and what means return on investment. And of course, uh, in the ocean, uh, particularly, uh, return on investment is also return on on impact. I mean, the more you uh, invest in these ecosystems, um, the more likely they, uh, they they are having a positive effect on the ocean's capacity to store carbon, the ocean's capacity to um, to restore biodiversity. I mean, there are about two million species in the ocean that we don't even haven't even discovered yet, and these are vital for future uh, for future uh, potential benefits, such as discovering you know new antibiotics or antiviral drugs and all these kind of things. We just had a 
we were still in a global pandemic and we haven't even harnessed the ocean's capacity in terms of genetic resources. And that was one of the focus areas, as you know, of the high seas treaty, which was just um, concluded on a, in a way agreed um, at the same time as our summit in uh, in Lisbon and New York, uh, diplomats came together to agree the high seas treaty. And it's absolutely vital to have this diplomatic uh, effort as well to protect 30% of the ocean, as well as land by 2030. And this high sea street is absolutely vital in setting the scene for that. Yeah, I'd love it if you wouldn't mind uh, just taking us a little bit more through that. I mean, have you been across some of those negotiations in recent years? We we understand the negotiations have been going for, for decades, but really it has yeah. ramped up in the last few years and people mm. could sense that we were getting closer and closer. I know when you did your analysis at the start of the year, it was pretty clear that this would be the year where the agreement would be made. Um, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit more about the process and, and yeah, what it means for, for humanity and for planet ocean. Yeah, it's absolutely vital, Sam. I mean, you know, the, these these negotiations have been going on for for many years, as you said, as almost twenty years that that the, these negotiations have been going on, and it's it's really the missing piece because you know the, this international um, you know convention of the law of the sea that had had been around for for a long time in the early nineteen eighties. There had already been an agreement on international shipping as well as deep sea mining. So these are two core areas in terms of governing kind of the, the seas. But the piece that was missing, uh, has been missing, uh, is, is the high seas treaty, which is really about creating and managing marine protected areas in the high seas. But also, you know, more, more deeper is issues such as, you know, how do you assess the environmental impact uh, of ocean related human activities over you know in the in the high seas in this vast space uh, because often this is a space where there has been a lot of activity that hasn't been controlled lots of illegal unreported fishing and so on for example and then it's also about sharing you know these marine genetic resources fairly um, of course, these you know these have lots of benefits that we haven't even explored yet. I mean, I mentioned the pharmaceuticals, but also all kinds of food sources that we haven't yet um, haven't yet explored. They could really benefit society. And then finally, finding a way to kind of fund um, these kind of uh, you know the, these kind of uh, benefits in terms of uh, these kind of activities, um, but also uh, technical support for developing countries and th this is one of the biggest issues here but also more broadly and we know from you know from the cop um 20 27 conversations uh, about climate that there's a similar issue around justice and damage and loss and there is a there is also a conversation around who benefits you know is it going just going to be industrialized countries that basically have the means and the capacity to explore and and harness some of these resources so it was vital that this high seas treaty put in place these four elements so the creation and management of these marine protected areas the environmental impact assessment the sharing uh, of the uh, marine genetic resource and finally the you know the funding and technical support for developing nations and that's finally been agreed but the real work only starts now because now it's about implementing this agreement the national legislation that has to follow but also making sure that this is that isn't just kind of the you know these 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 so-called paper parks because what has happened with marine protected areas is that legal protection is put in place but it isn't real protection it's just legal protection but not actual protection so the real work really starts now mm, fascinating i can only imagine some of those people that have been deep in the work on this piece for a long time must be Feeling good, but also realising that it's not the end of the story. It's in many ways chapter one. We need to now actually get them working and obviously, as you said, to manage them. Exactly. So we really got inspired to have this conversation with you based upon this uh, this work around the how the ocean flows through the uh, 17 UN mm. SDG. So let's spend a bit of time on this. And I'd really like to encourage listeners to, to check out. We'll have obviously links in our show notes, but yeah, look up the Ocean and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and you can actually see this interactive feature that just creates a bit of connectivity between each of those 17 SDGs and some interesting insights to some ocean connections. So if you're up for it, Martin, I think we might get stuck in and, um, and just talk a little bit about these, these goals and their relationship with the ocean. Hmm. Oh, definitely, Tim. I mean, that, that's really such an exciting part of the work that we've recently done because... 
you know, as, as I've said, you know, in the past, a lot of people have focused on SDG 14 and they have basically said, you know, it's the most underfunded SDG. Uh, you know, the ocean has been neglected and, and the ocean is kind of out of mind, out of sight, as we have said. Um, and that's, of course, if you focus on SDG 14, you know, the one about life um, below water. But if you actually look at all of the SDGs, the opportunity um, for the ocean and also harnessing the ocean's capacity to help us, you know, for sustainable development, uh, it is enormous. I mean, I, I'm just going to, and, and you mentioned that we have the um, opportunity to look at, at everything in detail and we have everything on uh, impact.economist.com forward slash ocean where you can explore the um, infographic. But just by way of a couple of examples, you know, if you just look at, for example, SDG 1, which is about poverty, of course, there's really this enormous opportunity for the ocean to help um, to reduce poverty because, I mean, uh, more than 3 billion people already depend on coastal and marine ecosystems. So really the ocean already helps um, to, to reduce poverty. And of course, fishing and aquaculture is a, an enormous um, opportunity there with already about 60 million people almost uh, being employed in that industry. And 84% of fishers and fish farmers uh, in Asia, for example, and there are a lot of, um, you know, artisanal and, and small scale farmers that really, uh, you know, uh, benefit from the ocean, also, uh, uh, you know, management of the ocean economy. So dealing with poverty through uh, through the ocean is absolutely vital. But also, if you look at SDG 2, zero hunger, I mean, I mentioned already the, the huge opportunity from uh, Blue Foods. And Blue Foods is really, um, you know, all the different kind of uh, marine uh, sources of, of, of food. And already uh, it's the main source of protein for uh, around 3 billion people. But then if we look at um, the opportunity uh, from harnessing more of these blue foods, it's, it's absolutely incredible. I mentioned the study by the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy that highlighted that two thirds of all of our human protein needs could come from sustainable aquaculture by 2050, uh, for example. And um, there's this huge opportunity that the ocean could provide, um, you know, over six times more food than it does today. Um, and that is uh, that is just incredible. We haven't even uh, scratched the surface of the opportunity to, to address um, hunger through through the ocean. And then, of course, SDG three, um, which is about health. And I mentioned already some of the opportunities uh, for, for uh, exploring some of those kind of genetic resources of the ocean and, and also, you know, protecting and harnessing those resources um, to discover uh, new um, new pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, antivirus, for example. And of course, we also need to make sure that we um, restore ocean health because some of those kind of risks uh, we have kind of as, as as humans we have created some of those risks uh, and we know this through plastics you know microplastics is a big problem but one of the biggest neglected issues is chemicals and actually uh, one of our sister initiatives at economist impact is the back to blue initiative that has looked at the invisible wave of chemical pollution so looking at things like mercury arsenic lead lead and these kind of things and they are really um, you know entering our food system through through the ocean and that's because we haven't really taken care of um, of those chemicals in our value chains and they have entered the ocean similar to microplastics so in addition to the opportunity from the ocean we also need to make sure that we restore ocean health to minimize those risks but then there's also um, sdg4 if you look at like quality education um, and, you know, th this is really the decade. And I mentioned, you know, we have our World Ocean Summit and there is the High Seas Treaty. Uh, and last year we had a WTO agreement on harmful uh, subsidies on fishing um, and the Global Plastics Treaty. I mean, there's so much um, momentum now for the ocean. Uh, but this is really the decade of the ocean. As you know, this is the UN decade for ocean science. Um, and, and this is an opportunity also to harness the ocean's uh, capacity to, to help us in terms of education, in terms of nature-based uh, training and skills and these kind of things. It's really about lifelong learning, including lifelong emotional connection uh, with the environment and, and the ocean uh, in particular as, as, as well. There is a huge opportunity to um, increase ocean literacy. Um, I mean, the UN Secretary General's um, Special Envoy for the Ocean, Peter Thompson, he identified, you know, when we asked him, 
how would you spend one billion dollars if you had one billion dollars to spend on an ocean solution? He actually said he would spend it on ocean literacy, which is one of the biggest um, opportunities as well. If people know more about the ocean, about all the things we just talked about, then they would also um, they would be more connected with the ocean. They would see the full potential of the blue economy as well. So education is absolutely vital. But then. Um, you know, even the other SDGs uh, are, are connected with the ocean. I mean, look at, for example, gender equality is one of those key uh, issues that we have recently looked at. I mean, we have featured, for example, the Sea Rangers uh, on our uh, platform, which is a, a great organization that helps um, helps with um, you know reducing gender inequality by really helping to bring women into the ocean workforce. Um, for example, I mean, in aquaculture and fisheries. 90% uh, of women are employed in underpaid or, or unpaid work. And that's really something we need to address. And that is an opportunity to, if you look at, um, you know, the kind of skills we just mentioned um, and really helping also with the tourism industry, for example, I mean, more than half of, of employees in the tourism workforce uh, that are ocean connected as well, obviously, uh, are women. Um, so we really need to look at how, uh, you know, the ocean can help us r address some of those issues. And I mentioned organizations like the Sea Rangers, but others that are really helping to restore uh, gender balance. Um, so that's a key issue we look at as well. And then, of course, SDG 6, which is about clean water and sanitation. And that's, of, as I mentioned, very much connected with the issues around pollution. So we have uh, ocean plastic, of course. Um, you know, there's 80% of ocean plastic is, you know, comes from, you know, 1,600 rivers. So it's really important to look at those rivers and look at, you know, cities as well. At, at, at Economist Impact, we've created the City Water Optimization Index. And partly a reason for that is that a lot of the kind of uh, problems, but also solutions for, uh, for the ocean and in general for water quality come from cities. So it's absolutely vital to look at that. Um, and of course, looking at uh, desalination, turning salt uh, water kind of into safe, drinkable, fresh water, and looking at uh, doing that in a, in a secure and safe way in water stressed environments is important. Um, so that's an area we look at. It. But of course, um, also energy, SDG 7, which is about affordable and clean energy. The energy opportunity in the ocean is absolutely um, incredible. I mean, there is offshore wind, which you know people talk about, but they haven't even scratched the surface of the opportunity. Uh, of course, there is lots of investment, for example, in, in, in Europe in that space, but it's really an un underinvested area. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for um, for offshore wind to help us reach um, our climate goals. But then there's also tidal stream, wave energy, some of the more kind of under-reported opportunities that need to be really looked at. So the ocean can be a huge opportunity to deal with our energy crisis and our dependency on fossil fuels. Hope you enjoyed part one of this incredible episode with Martin Kering. Thanks to Martin for being on the podcast. Stay tuned for part two. And as always, if you enjoyed this, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. If you're on Spotify, you can answer a little Q&A card there and let us know what moment you loved best. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, leave us a comment. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.